seven through 12 high school, middle school, high school. It is best known as the oldest school in the country. It was founded in 1635. So the urban legend goes that they created Boston Latin School and then once the students needed a form of higher education beyond that, they founded Harvard for these students. Okay, so there's a lot of history, there's a lot of tradition, there's a lot of legacy at this school. It's also what we call an exam school, which means students need to test in to this school. There are three exam schools in Boston, uh, Boston Latin School and two others. They're all phenomenal schools, but I wanna give you the impression that the students that are here have worked really hard to be here and they've gone through these standardized tests and they've landed here and it's a rather rigorous curriculum. Um, and we graduate quite a few students into the Ivy Leagues. And I say this not to impress you, but just to give you a sense of the culture here at the school. Um, a lot of high achieving students, a lot of very invested parents who want to know about their grades and their college applications. And so what am I doing here? Well, there was an alumnus named Joe Deitch, 1968, who said to the Latin School administration about 10 years ago, the students need professional job development and training. The school knows how to do academics. We need to get them ready for the professional world. So he wrote a very generous check to the school and said, please, let's start a quote unquote leadership institute. Many conversations later with this founder, funder, and visionary, he said, Jim, here's what you, I don't need you to do. Please do not teach the students leadership theories in the classroom. I need you to get them ready for the professional world. Good luck, have fun. So I spent a lot of time developing workshops and after school uh, classes around workshops, um, excuse me, around resumes and professional interviewing skills, uh, financial literacy, uh, introduction to the stock market, entrepreneurship, and uh, a rather robust internship program over the summer, which we're gonna talk a lot about later. So I'm the leadership guy at the school, but what leadership looks like here is professional development for high achieving high schoolers. That's me. I'm gonna pause for a second here and click into this case study. So folks, I have three case studies for you. I wanna get us talking, at least active in the chat. And I wanna kind of show you some of the issues I've come across around getting students ready for the professional world in this current online environment because a lot of at least the internships with me have been remote the past two years. Let me see if I can get rid of this really down below. Stop recording. There it is, perfect. Okay, so here's the situation. I have this student, we'll call him Alex. He's a very bright young man. He is the fourth child. His older three siblings are all at Harvard. The parents are very active in the school. They are very generous, very kind, very humble. The students are wonderful, polite. They recognize their privileges, very hardworking. Alex came on board and he was hired to be an intern with me. And I send them off to an organization in the city. Two weeks into his internship, Alec sends me a text. He said, Mr. Levesque, so I'll just give it to you straight. I'm gonna be in Italy starting on Saturday and I'll be there for the next month. But since my internship is remote right now, I can work from Italy, right? I already sent an email to my supervisor at the company, so I'm hoping we can work this out. So then I immediately send an email to the head of school, our principal, and I said, here's a heads up because she knows this family, she respects this family, she loves this family. I said, so Alex has been working at this company and he's only a few weeks in and he's gonna be going to Italy on Saturday for the, about a, a month and then returning sometime in August. And he's talking to his current supervisor to see if this is gonna be permitted. I spoke with Alex, I said, Alex, ah, this is a very tricky arrangement. I don't know if we can accommodate this. He's like, oh, I think we can work it out, Mr. Levesque. I mean, I can just work remotely from Italy. It's a few hours time difference, I'll make it work. I said, okay. So I met with the organization and I said, so what do we think about Alex? And Michael and Jessica are his supervisors. Michael said, you know what, Jim? I think we can make this work. So why does he just head off to Italy? and we'll put a pause on the internship and then we'll pick it back up in August. I said, well, that's very generous of you, Michael. Okay. 
Jessica said, I don't have a problem with it either. Let me talk to human resources. We may want the technology back that we gave him for this internship. They sent him two monitors and a ThinkPad. I said, okay, this sounds promising. Let's huddle back up tomorrow morning and make sure this all sounds good. And they were gonna speak with human resources. The next morning I speak with Jessica and Michael. I said, so what are we thinking about Alex? Are we, are we really gonna let him go to Italy and pause his internship? Michael completely does a 180. He said, you know what, Jim, I thought about it. I think we just need to cut our losses. He said, you know what, Alex has a project I'd given him. He had just started it, but it's rather time sensitive and now he won't be able to finish it. Also, I was gonna have Alex do our onboarding system here at the company, which he'll now miss. And he said to me, and Jim, if you remember, we were very accommodating with Alex because he had a start date, but then he had to push it back because he had a soccer tournament in another state. And so he started a few days later and we were very accommodating. He goes, and Jim, I just, I just get the sense that Alex, Alex hasn't been told no a lot in his life. So, I think we should just cut our losses. He should go to Italy. He's going to see family and we'll just call it done. I said, okay, I appreciate that. And so I notified Alex of the decision. And he said, Mr. Levesque, I, I understand, but I'd really like to talk to Mike. Um, I'd really just like to follow up with him. I said, Alex, you're welcome to do so, but I don't think anything's going to change. I understand that, Mr. Levesque, and I appreciate it, but uh, I still want to talk to Mike. I said, okay. So he talked to Michael. And Michael gave him the same rationale. And then I connected with Alex right before he got on the plane to Italy. And Alex said to me over text, he said, you know what, I talked to Michael and uh, we had a, a mutual decision that this was probably best that I just stopped the internship right now. Um, I'm heading off to Italy, Mr. Levesque. I'm gonna see some family. Um, I'll see you at the end of the summer. And I said, enjoy your family, Alex. So here's the first poll question. And Kristen, I'm not sure if you can help me with this. But if you were Michael and you knew that Alex wanted to pause this internship or work remotely, what would you have done? Would you have done what Michael did and just say, listen, we're terminating the internship, we're cutting our losses? Or would you have paused the internship and say, enjoy Italy, you can pick this back up when you return in August? Or would you have said, you know what, we can make this work from Italy. So fly over there and then we'll pick this up or maybe something else. A second to chew on that. All righty. Some will terminate and some will ask for more commitment. Okay. I appreciate that honesty. All right. So before I get into the, uh, today's agenda, let me just talk quickly and put a fine point on um, Alex's situation. So, with every these, all these case studies, folks, I want to kind of draw a line as to some of the trends I'm starting to see with young people now with internships and working remotely and things like that. So Alex was a classic case of a student that's overscheduled. And Alex had a soccer tournament right at the start of the summer. And Alex has legitimately a side business with the patent that he's running on the side. And Alex is a 4.0 student. And Alex had this internship with me, but also family in Italy and probably six other things. And I'm finding that our students are overscheduled because they're trying to stack resumes and get to college, which I can truly sympathize with because it's so competitive this, these days. And I don't think our students know how to juggle everything. And I know for me, at least, the students don't know exactly where a professional internship falls in terms of the priorities of the summer. So that's one thing I've noticed. I've also noticed they're not quite sure how to navigate remote work and how some think if they've just done their project, then they're done for the day and they can close their laptop at one o'clock p.m. And some think, no, you stay in your workstation until five o'clock. And some think I can work from anywhere, Boston, New York, Italy, what does it really matter? I just need a laptop. And so remote life is happening, but there hasn't been a lot of conversations around expectations as to when you work and how you work and your availability and things like that. Um, a few more things I'll get into later, uh, but one thing I will say about Alex, and I really enjoy this young man and I love the family, but one thing that note, I noted about how this all started was that first text from Alex. And he didn't ask me 
if he could go to Italy and maybe take a pause on his internship. He told me he's going to Italy and uh, we can make this work. That's what he kept saying, Mr. Levesque, we can make this work. We can make this work. And, and, and for me, I always struggled with, we might be able to make this work, but I really loved it if you would have come to this conversation with, here's the situation, Mr. Levesque, can we make this work? I do apologize for this last minute inconvenience, this issue, can we work something out? I'm not quite sure. Give me your feedback, give me your guidance. Um, and I'm finding that with a lot of students is that they're telling me that they have conflicts and there's an expectation that I accommodate those conflicts, whatever they are, some very legitimate, others that make me kind of scratch my chin a little bit. So before I move on, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on this or comments or we can just leave them until the end. Yeah, one thing, Jim, it looks like your poll is still open on the screen, so we can't see your slides. It looks like a big gray box. Oh, it's getting better. How about now? Yes. See the slide? I can see the slide, absolutely. Okay. And it, yep, it looks like other people are nodding. And I think while you were chatting or while you're talking, Lauren shared in the in the chat that that she's seeing this happen all the time with students. Mm. We talk about this like at every staff meeting is like this accommodation, like students expect to be accommodated. There, there is a very blanket expectation of accommodation and there isn't a conversation. It is, I'm gonna go do this. How are you gonna make it work for me? Right. Yeah, and I feel like and at least for the students I've worked with, it hasn't been malicious intent. It hasn't no. been a grand sense of entitlement. It's just like, so I'm triple booked. So what can you do for me? <laughs> and I'm like, well, yes. and so I tell my students all the time, I need, it needs to start with a question. I need you to defer that respect to us. It, it, and then I can definitely work with you. But um, when I'm just told what's going to happen, I'm like, how? Oh, I struggle with that. Let's, let's talk. Let's talk. So thank you for that comment. All right, good people. Looking at the time, want to respect your time. Uh, okay, so today we're going to do two more of those case studies. I'm going to talk quickly about two programs I'm very proud of, resumes and professional interviewing skills at scale over Zoom using Google Classroom. I might touch on LinkedIn program that I run a little bit, um, but then I'm going to get into the professional etiquette that I teach with my students. Um, I'll show you that, and we'll finish off with some more case studies. So. Buckle in, let's go. Here's the next poll question. Kristen, if you wouldn't mind, please. I'd be curious to know when you created your first professional resume. When did you create your first professional resume? Was it in high school, undergrad, grad school if you attended, or was it after college? Or maybe you're so hip and trendy, you're like, what's a resume? I just apply through LinkedIn. Okay, high school and undergrad wins. Mine was undergrad because I had a friend that was he used to say he was 20 going on 40. He was working for a congressman. He had a fancy car. He had a fancy laptop. He was well beyond his years. And I, I stole his resume template. And, um, and that's how I built my resume when I was in college. So I feel like it's a different world these days. And our students do need a resume. At the very least, when they apply to college, if they have a resume that's done, they can easily cut and paste from that resume into their college application. So it makes it a lot easier for them. And when I tell the students, I'm like, listen, I know it feels young. We do it with our sophomores. So they're 16, 15 years old. I said, we're not trying to scare you. We're just trying to introduce the concept to you. So let's walk through this together. And at the very least, it might be an awareness exercise where you say, huh, I haven't done much in high school. Maybe I should start going to that club meeting. Maybe I should join that track team that I've been meaning to join and just kind of wake them up a little bit to the fact that soon colleges and businesses will be looking at them and see how they appear on a single piece of paper. So here's what we do. This high school that I work in, very busy. We require, we require four years of the Latin language in addition to another language. So there's not a lot of space in the academic curriculum and the academic day for anything. So my supervisor said, Jim, please teach them how to have a good resume, but it has to be a required workshop or they won't go. It has to be one study block for 45 minutes, okay? 
And if you can get this done in about a month and a half, we'd appreciate it. And I was like, oh boy, okay, here we go. So we built something in Google Classroom. Um, whoops, I'll get to that in a second. Um, and it's been remarkable and we've scaled it out and we, we have the students for 45 minutes during the study block. And like Jim, how do you teach them resume in 45 minutes? We teach them the bones of a resume in 45 minutes, but we walk them through it. And then afterwards they're ready to go. They're springboarded into a professional resume. So really quick, put this in the chat. I'm gonna quiz you right now, folks. Take a look at this resume. This is an athlete, some would say a Boston sports icon who in the late 90s graduated from the University of Michigan, a football player who recently retired. Who resume is this? And this is what I show my students as like a do now to hook them into the resume workshop. Abby, I don't think it's Bart. <laughs> Austin I think it is. <laughs> <Boston>. <laughs> Not a fan. <laughs> uh, so I do this very intensely with my students because they're coming from Latin class. They're coming from physics class. They're stressed. They're worried. They're trying to maintain their 4.0. And I'm like, welcome. I'm Mr. Levesque. We're going to talk about your resume. Look at me like, what? 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 What are you talking about? So I do this and they go, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm in. This is the resume of Tom Brady. He posted this as a throwback Thursday a few years ago. I saw it on the interwebs. I pulled that thing down fast. And this was also a, um, a mock-up of someone correcting Tom's resume because much as I love Tom and appreciate him for all the championships, in the late 90s, when he was about to graduate from college, his resume was garbage. And that's what I tell my students. And it's a little provocative and they kind of giggle, but then I hooked them in and said, now we have to build a resume for you. And I promise you in 45 minutes, it's gonna look better than Tom Brady's. And they're like, whoo, all right, Mr. Lovac, let's go. So we use Google Classroom, we love Google Classroom. Um, this is what it looks like in the classwork section of the classroom. We give them three resume templates. When we say people, pick one, just pick one. It's all filled in with some of the basic information. And from there, you're gonna build your resume in real time right now. Every single workshop, I've got two or three students who are like, Mr. Lovett, I already have a resume. Do I need to be here? I'm like, Actually, yes, you do. I would love to see your resume. Can you bring it up for me, please? They're like, oh, sure, I guess. And so once I get the students going in the workshop, I'll go over to their workstation. I'm like, I'd love to see your resume. And nine times out of 10, the resume is not very good. Now, I'm very impressed at 15, 16 years old, they have taken upon themselves, or maybe they had an older sibling that built the resume for them. But no one sits through the class and says, that was a waste of my time, which is the goal. So three resume templates, we give them this one. And you can see how it's all built out with Boston Latin School information. We give them exemplars. The grayed out language is examples and it's tips and strategies. And we go section by section by section with them. This is one option they can take. This is the one that has skills, but no professional experience yet. Resume template number two is a nice balance of everything. A little volunteer, a little bit of skills, a little bit of professional, et cetera. I say, or folks, you can check resume number three, which is for those that have so much to put in their resume. And I do have a couple of these students, even in high school, who struggle to put all of their content onto one page. I said, this is a good one, but it's got some formatting tricks. And I say, pick one, and we're off and running. You're going to be working on this document for the rest of your adult life. And they were like, what? I'm like, I promise you, you will. So then we hit the ground running. We go through each section. Um, I tell them how to write bullets in their resume, how to use numbers and how to start with a strong action verb and give specifics and details, but don't be too verbose and blah, blah, blah. And so they're nodding along and they're typing things in. Some of them are like, Mr. Levesque, what's a good action verb? I'm like, I got you. Look at your classroom. Here's a nice list of action verbs. And the point is, is that every last resource they could ever want is in that Google Classroom. So even if they're kind of asleep, they have everything they need, right? And those, I'll go to this slide, those resources in Google Classroom are there forever. And it's in their personalized Google Classroom. So they can go into a Google Classroom in 20 years. And as long as Google's still existing and a classroom is still existing, they will have these resources. So we do all of that. And at the end, I make this point in a very serious tone. I say, good people, we don't like to use the word perfect around here because it's an exercise in futility. Right? A lot of my students struggle in perfectionism. I said, but I need to tell you, I'm gonna be straight with you guys, you're young adults. 
the resume has to be perfect. And by that, I mean no errors, no formatting um, mistakes, no uh, lacking of grammar, uh, none of that. Like it has to be perfect. And so I say, work on it, send it to me, send it to my colleague, we'll meet with you and we'll make sure that it is good to go. But this is not a homework assignment. This is something that is reflection of you. And some of like, for Mr. Levesque, I'm so much more than a single piece of paper. I said, absolutely, you are so much more. But I'm here just to tell you the professional world wants to see a single piece of paper. So work on this. Let me know if you want to talk at another study and we can go through it and make sure it is perfect and good to go. Like, okay, Mr. Levesque, and then the bell rings and then they're off. And we do that for about five or six weeks 30 or 40 students a day. That is the sophomore resume lab. Folks, if you're like Jim, you're talking a lot, you got a lot of good details here. Listen, I will send you everything I have. I'll make you a student in my Google Classroom. You can have all these decks, all of my tools. Don't worry for a moment. I can send you everything. So we're going to keep moving because I'm watching the time. That's the sophomore resume lab. We then thought, you know what? We need and a um, job interview lab as well. And we think the juniors need that. So folks, here's the next poll, please. I would be curious to know, of all these questions, I don't know if you can see this, how many of the questions listed below have you been asked in an interview before? And I list six or seven questions. Is it seven? Yes. Um, that are frequently asked in an interview. And I'm curious if you have ever been asked some of these, most of these, all of these, or none of these. Wow, this floating thing under here. I tell it to go away and it reappears. Okay, good, good, good. Appreciate the response. Show the results, people, most or all. Beautiful, love that. When I do this for students, this is my initial hook. I say, folks, who's been asked these questions in an interview? And some of them had internships and some of them had um, some professional experiences and almost every single student raised their hand was like, yeah, Mr. Levesque, I was asked all these questions. I said, I know, listen, we're gonna hack the interview process. I'm gonna teach you how to prepare for an interview. So looking at the time, I think we can do this. I'm gonna pause and show you. In the sophomore resume lab, I showed you Tom Brady. Now I'm gonna show you what my do now is for this class. I'm gonna stop the share and I'm gonna show you a quick video. And this is the internship with Owen Wilson and Vince Vaughn. And this is how I hook my students around interview skills in a remote environment. Share the screen, make sure my volume is up. Share sound, optimize for video clip. Cancel this, good to go. Okay. We can see you guys. Sound keeps cutting in and out for me. I don't know if any what's happening to anyone else. It's 
So hopefully they're hooked at that point. And then we're off and running, talking about how to navigate and do interviews over Zoom. So let's get back to the deck. I'm gonna go through this rather quickly because I wanna get to those other two case studies and just show you how I teach them interview skills. And like I mentioned, folks, I spend a lot of time on those frequently asked interview questions. Share. Slide deck. So the junior uh, interview lab looks a lot like the sophomore one. Same kind of logistics, same structure. We have about 400 students in every class. And we have one study block, and we do this for about four or five weeks. Um, and we give them everything they need over Google Classroom. So we go through attire, what's appropriate. We talk about how to prepare for an interview but we spent a significant amount of time on these frequently asked interview questions. And they get really excited because the students here are always saying, what's gonna be on the test, Mr. Levac? Or what's, can you give me a grading rubric? Like, okay, you want, a, you want a rubric for job interviews? If you can prepare these questions, you will do well. But I tell them very clearly, folks, this is not an oral quiz. This is not a presentation. This is a conversation. But if you have some talking points, nothing, no, don't be scripted. But if you have some talking points around these questions, you will do well in the interview. And so we get into it and I go through each question with different options and I say, okay, folks, what's a good answer here? What's a good answer there? We kind of go back and forth and they really appreciate that. And we do it for all the questions, right? And I start to tell them what's not a really good answer or what's a better answer. And again, I'm not giving them a script. I'm just trying to educate them about how to show up, how to present themselves, what's inappropriate, what's very appropriate. And so they very much appreciate that. And we spend a lot of time in this document, which is in their Google Classroom. It's every single question I just showed you, the most frequently asked questions, a good way to answer it, and some hints and tips about how to go about it. And I give them some time in the workshop and they chip away at each question. I tell them a story about um, always being respectful and tactful and taking the high road because the world is very small. We had a student that I'll just say spoke out of turn and trashed, quote unquote, their former supervisor who just happened to be the wife of the person they were now interviewing with. And so it was just messy and unprofessional. So I tell them that story just around etiquette. Um, I tell them that they should come with questions. I tell them a lot of this that was taught to me in graduate school when I was in business school. And I remember there was a consultant teaching this class at the time and they said to me when I was a grad student, listen, when there is an interview there and you're answering all your questions and you think you're sounding so eloquent and intelligent, the interviewer is thinking three things and wondering three things. Number one, does this person have the skill set? Number two, do they have the motivation to show up every day to work and give 100%? And number three, do I like them? Do I want to spend 40 or 50 hours a week with them? And so I, this has actually become true for me as a professional. And so I tell the students, like, listen, folks, the skills of the resume, and we'll get you up to speed. The motivation, you don't have to worry about it. You're a Latin school student. You work incredibly hard. If anything, I got to try to scale back my students and say, you need more sleep. You need more rest. I said, but folks, a lot of interviews, especially entry-level positions or internships, it's about personality. So I talk to them about making that connection and try to be their most authentic self and maybe laugh a little bit or, or just tell stories or tell anecdotes. And they're like, okay, Ms. Levesque, I get it. How do I do that? We have to build rapport. They're like, okay, how do I build rapport? And they're like taking notes. It's so cute. I was like, okay, how do you build rapport? And let me get this, oh, these floating controls. I'm telling you. Like, you want to know how to build rapport? I said, it's a process. It takes practice. But here's a few things to do. Mirror body language. Use people's names. Ask thoughtful questions. Lots of smiles. Lean into the conversation. And they're like, okay, okay. Let's go back. So then we move on. Talk about how to wrap up the interview. Thank you notes. Make sure you Google yourself and know what's out there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we leave them with a ton of resources in their Google Classroom. Everything we discussed, interview tips, all of that. So they feel like they are ready to go. So that's the junior interview lab. And for both this and the sophomore um, resume lab, it translates very well over Zoom. 
I prefer to have the students in front of me because then I can walk to their desks and kind of, you know, over their shoulder, kind of coach them and mentor them. But breakout rooms and Zoom, it hasn't been a problem. It's actually been very successful. I talked about how we don't like to use perfection or perfect around here. And so I try to tell the students, listen, with, with interviewing, you just got to practice it. It's a muscle that you have to just do it a few times. So I invite them to do a mock interview with me or some of my colleagues. And I used to put up this image, but now I put up this image. Practice doesn't make perfect, it makes progress, it brings understanding of what works and what doesn't work, it ups your skill, creates new habits and it builds your confidence. And they can definitely relate to that. So that's the junior interview lab. And again, if you want any of my materials, I would gladly send those along to you. Well, let's get to the next, next case study. Scene Magazine is a small local magazine in Boston, and they consider themselves a magazine that covers Boston culture, food, fashion, pop culture, current events, things that's going on around the city. They took one of my interns, uh, a senior. Uh, the student's name is, well, I know the student's name, but I'm gonna protect the identity. Um, we're gonna call this student Thomas. So, C Magazine published an article in July, 2021. Um, no, nope, that's a mistake, it's July, 2020, excuse me. This is right at the height of COVID. And my intern was remote and he's working for this, this magazine. He was excited, they were excited. Um, this was right before he was heading off to college. And there was this article, your immune system is the first line of defense, okay? And this was by a Dr. Shiva Hyadurai. Dr. Shiva Hyadurai, okay? This will become relevant in a second. I'm gonna jump over this slide. At the end of the summer, I get a call from the supervisor. I forget the woman's name, let's call her Barbara. I actually think it was Barbara. She says, Jim, I have some concerns. Thomas has not completed his projects. Um, and she's just kind of pushing back on a lot of the bigger things I had him work on all summer. Can you follow up with him? I have some concerns. I said, of course, I apologize. So I talked to Thomas and Thomas is in rare form. He's like, Mr. Levesque, I don't wanna work for this magazine anymore. I was like, What's going on? You have like a week left. He said, did you see that article that they just published? I said, no, buddy, I didn't see the article. He's like, take a look, Mr. Levesque. So this is the article, your immune system is the first line of defense by this Dr. Shiva Hayadurai. The doctor talks about he, well, let me qualify. This is cut and pasted from the article and um, these are the, the, the man's credentials up top. He has a doctorate, he's not a medical doctor, he has a doctorate in systems biology at MIT within the Department of Biological Engineering. I don't know exactly what that means to be completely honest. I do know he's not a medical doctor, just so we're clear. I'm not trying to make judgments. I'm just trying to be clear. So in this article, um, this young man, this man talks about what he believes people need to stay healthy in the age of COVID. And so my intern took particular issue with that one blue line you see on your screen. So this gentleman was talking that vitamin C is very healthy for you. Oranges, strawberries, kale, lemons, and sweet yellow peppers are where you can get vitamin C. And then he says this, I believe that many coronavirus patients before being put on ventilators could have survived with high dosage intravenous vitamin C. My student read that and he took great issue with that. And then he Googled this man's name and he learned that this man has a, um, a colorful past. He's a controversial figure. He's well known to be, um, I'll just say controversial because I don't want to get into anything that even smells like politics right now. But the point is that my intern, Thomas said, I cannot believe this man who's not technically a medical doctor is giving his opinion on this and saying something that my intern thought was misinformation um, coming from a charlatan. He's like, and I don't want to be a part of this magazine, Mr. Levesque. He said, I will give you back the stipend. I don't want to be paid by them. I just want to sever this relationship. I want to head off to college. I said, okay. So we talked a little bit more and I said, Thomas, what about your other projects? Because you just learned about this magazine article. Because Thomas 
had some like administrative stuff that he was doing all summer that he wasn't too crazy about, but he's like, all right, Mr. Beck, I'll do it. And at the end of the summer, he was gonna write an article for them. And so he started going through all of their magazines. And that's when he came across that article I just showed you. And he immediately said, I don't wanna write an article for these people. In fact, I don't even wanna be employed by these people. So I said, Thomas, let's pause. How are the other projects going? He's like, I don't like my other project, Mr. Beck. I said, okay, why? He's like, it's all just database stuff and it's all just administrative and it's boring. And the way they have their spreadsheets, it's so inefficient. And I was like, Thomas, oh, oh, buddy, hold on. I checked in with you every week. In fact, we had like a midsummer performance check-in. And I remember you said you didn't love your project, but you weren't speaking this strongly about it. He's like, yeah, I'm just sick of it. It's just the way they organized the spreadsheet. I just, I can't believe they did it this way. It's like, well, did you tell Barbara that you have a different way of doing it? It's like, no, I couldn't be bothered. I was like, so you just kind of sat on this all summer? He's like, honestly, yeah, Ms. Levesque, if I'm going to be honest with you, I sleep most days. I kind of dial in around four or five o'clock in the afternoon when I wake up. I take a look at my email and I keep chipping away at my projects. I was like, you sleep in most days? He's like, yeah, I mean, whatever. I was like, oh, Thomas. I said, okay, all right. So you've never given them feedback about how you could develop the spreadsheet differently and, and be more efficient with it. He's like, no, I didn't bother. I just try to push through it, but I'm just, I'm done now, Mr. Levesque. And now that I see this article and I, I can't be a part of this organization, I said, okay, let's just pause. He's like, I don't want the stipend. I don't want the, I'm like, okay, let's just pause. So long story short, I talked to Barbara. I talked to Thomas. Um, I did issue him his stipend. I did talk to Barbara about Thomas's concerns. She said, you know what, Jim, we're okay with the article that we ran. We're just a platform. We don't take opinions. I said, okay, that's your magazine. Um, and Thomas headed off to college and I decided to sever my relationship with this magazine moving forward. So what's my takeaways from this situation? What I'm finding from not just Thomas, but a lot of my students is, um, and I, you know, some adults too, I'm not gonna judge. There is a very, very strong avoidance around any conversation that could be remotely confrontational, right? And so I check in with my interns weekly. Like I said, I do that midsummer performance review. I'm always checking in with the supervisors because I have to ask all the right questions for my students to come forward and say, yeah, I'm not loving my internship because they don't like to have those conversations. And I can appreciate that some of them are very comfortable over the keyboard, but not in person or even over Zoom to have these conversations. And so I'm not sure if there's a bigger conversation to be had here, but I will say this. I felt badly about how this all went down. I was understanding what Thomas was going through around my beliefs around what I just read in their article, I, I can't be a part of this organization. Um, I understood it. This is the world we're living in right now. Um, for the organization to say, I hear him, but we're gonna run the article. Taken in its totality, we don't think someone talking about the benefits of vitamin C is really that much of a bad thing. Um, but my concerns was that he didn't bring this to my attention sooner. And especially around that other project that was just more administrative. And that because of remote work, I didn't know that he was sleeping in every day until four or five o'clock. So those are the things that I've been struggling with, um, at least in terms of this situation. So if anyone has a comment, they can throw in the chat or on mute before I move on, um, gladly take it. Otherwise, we do have one more case study to go. And these floating controls, man, I tell you. Alrighty. We'll keep going. I'm gonna go through this real quickly, good people. So we use LinkedIn here at the school. Um, you know, I get the students to give their um, parents a heads up that they're using this. A lot of parents said to me, Mr. Levesque, do our students need to be on LinkedIn? Like, that, that's your call. I said, but could they benefit from it? Absolutely, because for me, LinkedIn is not just what you know, it's not just who you know, it's a combination therein. So I have a whole presentation on this. Students are like, Mr. Levesque, LinkedIn's for older people. I was like, not really, folks. Like LinkedIn is exploding with all demographics. And they're like, yeah, but it's the latest fad, it's the latest trend. It's going to go away, like Tumblr or even Snapchat right now. I'm like, nope, because Microsoft just bought it for $26 billion. LinkedIn's not going anywhere. Like, 
oh, okay, Mr. Levesque. So we spent some time and LinkedIn actually has a lot of resources for students, a lot of wonderful resources for students. They welcome students, they want students. So the platform is very conducive to them. So I teach the students how to use the, the platform, how to build a profile. I spend a lot of time in the job section, how to create job alerts. I tell the students, that's how I found my current job was through LinkedIn job alert. Like, oh, really? Yeah. So we go through that whole process. Um, this is the beautiful thing about LinkedIn. So I show my students, listen, go to the Boston Latin School alumni page. I said, look how many alumni are on LinkedIn, 9,700 plus. I said, look what LinkedIn does. They'll tell you where they live, where they work, what they do, what they've studied, and how you are connected to them. I said, so folks, this is why we use LinkedIn. It's to leverage those alumni connections. And then their eyes light up. They're like, oh, okay. And then we're off and running. We have a wonderful organization that works with our school that also tries to help our students get internships so they don't just have to rely on LinkedIn. We also tell students about all these other amazing uh, websites in terms of looking for work, but we do spend a significant amount of time just keeping it all in-house and trying to place our students um, individually. So that's LinkedIn very quickly. I'm taking a look at the time. I wanna to get to this last case study. So folks, in terms of the professional etiquette, this is a presentation I do for my interns right before they head off into their organizations, like around June. And we talk about professionalism. Now, again, to hook my students in, right, and get them engaged, I give them scenarios of real situations that have happened in the past where interns have been terminated or they put on a probationary status or just like a, a really obvious professional faux pas or flub, if you will. Um, we protect identities, obviously. But what I have my students do, I said, okay, folks, here's a scenario. Please read this and tell me what you would do if you were the supervisor. And the students kind of laugh. They're like, we're the supervisor? I said, yeah, you're the supervisor in this scenario. How would you handle this? And I have three different scenarios about students blowing off work or lying about why they didn't show up to work or What's this about? Oh, this one student texted his boss to say, hey, I'm not coming in tomorrow. Didn't have the right number. It actually was a number to a landline. The boss never got the message. The boss did not know that the student was gonna be out. It all turned into a thing. The student said, basically, it's not my problem. I texted who I thought was my boss. So what are you gonna do? So we go through these scenarios, but I tell my students, you're the supervisor. How would you respond? And my Goal in this is to get them to empathize with supervisors and understand some of these situations are really tricky. And it really kind of opens their eyes to what professionalism looks like in the workplace. We get into attire, how to be professional with social media on the organization's you know, network. Uh, this we can skip past, we talk about being punctual. I tell my students, no questions are dumb. And then I say, actually, I wouldn't say dumb, but I think some questions maybe shouldn't be asked if the information has been repeated a few times and you maybe you haven't been listening. And so I say to my students, good people, ask your questions, but first ask yourself, is there a way I can be resourceful and maybe solve this on my own before I go and ask my supervisor a question? I'm very careful with my language and they get it. I'm like, your supervisor is there for you to support you. But before you ask every little question, maybe you can try to solve it on your own as illustrated by this little graphic. And they're like, okay, Mr. Lovac, I get that. I tell them to stay in communication with their professors. Um, I have to skip this next video, which talks about the dangers of reply all. If you have a moment after this, just Google reply all Bridgestone tires. It's a Super Bowl commercial from about 10 years ago. Reply all, Bridgestone tires. It's pretty funny about, I don't know if we've all been there, but we've hit reply all when we meant just to hit reply. And then we say something that probably wasn't for the eyes of everybody on reply all. And then you regret it. All right, so we go through that. I give them some scenarios on how to be effective in their communication and specific and think outside of their own kind of bubble, if you will. And, they really appreciate kind of these tangible examples. We get into Zoom etiquette. I talked to them all about being alert and leaning in. I don't know about you folks, but I'm seeing this trend quite a bit. 
what I call the zoom forehead, the zoom forehead. And I tell my students, please, if you're comfortable, if we could bring the camera down so we can see your face, I would appreciate that. So we talk about Zoom etiquette. Um, this is just to make them laugh. Try to always be professional even when you're exhausted on Zoom. We get into how they'll be assessed in the, in the professional world, which they appreciate. No more grades, no more grades. And then I talked about what an internship is really for. And I said, folks, it's about development. It's about mentorship. It's about learning the culture of an organization. It's about growing as a young leader. Okay, last case study. Let's get into it. So folks, I had a young lady. Her name is, for the sake of this conversation, Christine. Christine works for the U.S. Attorney's Office here in Boston, the U.S. Attorney's Office in Boston. I get an email from Christine's supervisor. Let's call her Meredith. She says, hey, Jim, I just got an email from Christine, and here it is. And I'll summarize this for you. Christine, my intern, sent this email to her supervisor, said, hey, Meredith, thank you for our meeting. You had asked me to find local email addresses for colleges and universities in the area. And what we're gonna do with those email addresses is that we're gonna send out notice of grants that these colleges and universities can apply for if they like. I take issue with this project. And the issue that uh, Christine had was that she's like, I feel as if this grant money could be going to police departments. And as a community organizer and as a person of color, I would not be comfortable with being a conduit or enabling more money to be funneled to colleges and universities and specifically to their police departments. And then she talks about how, um, as an example, Harvard University Police Department um, have had a history of, as she claims here, sexism and racism for the past 20 years, and that they um, stood in, in favor of their fellow officers during the George Floyd protests. Um, and so my intern was making the point, I don't want to help grant money get to these colleges and universities. So Meredith, the supervisor contacted me and she said, Jim, um, so here's the situation. Um, here are the grant organizations. Again, I just asked Christina, the intern, just to get me some contact information for these colleges and universities. Get me an email address of like the Dean of Students, just so we can make them aware that these grant opportunities exist. One is from the Office of Violence Against Women. The other is the Office of Community Oriented Policing Services. And the other is the Office of Justice Programs. Um, and you can see some of the details on where some of the grant money would go. She's like, Jim, I don't know if the college universities will apply to these grants. I don't know if they will give the grant money to their police departments. She said, all I know is that I feel like Christine's making some assumptions. And while I do appreciate her values and her politics, she's like, the U.S. Attorney's Office is very much apolitical. And we work to do the people's job, uh, the people's work, I should say, and to serve the people. She said, I understand the U.S. attorney is appointed by the White House, but she's like, Jim, it doesn't matter. We still are prosecutors trying to do good work out there in the community. So I spoke with Christine. We talked back and forth. Um, I said, Christine, here's the situation. She's like, Mr. Levesque, here's my perspective. I said, okay, I hear you. She said, I hear what, Chris, what Meredith is saying now. I, I, I know this money is not going to go directly or could or could not go directly to the police departments. I said, yeah, we don't know. She said, I said, also, like, if you're going to college in the fall, which you are, you know, some of your tuition dollars may be going to police departments and some of your parents' taxpayers' money is going to the local police departments. I said, so I don't want you to abandon your values. I just want you to know, like, is this something that you want to get behind and do you want to not take on this project she thought about it she thought about it. she thought about it she's like no i'm comfortable doing the project I'm like, okay she's like oh yeah i'll just get some email addresses for them and whatever the colleges and universities do with that and if they apply if they're granted and what they do with that money she's like i feel okay with that and i appreciate you talking to me Mr. Levesque. I said, you're welcome you're welcome so the rest of the summer went on and um the student was happy the supervisors were happy um, 
and everything was fine. So the last poll question I have for you with two minutes to spare is, if you were Christine's supervisor, would you have required her to complete the project? Say, Christine, I hear your concerns, but you need to do the project. Or Christine, I hear your concerns. You don't have to do this project. You can do something else or other. Okay, in the poll, most people say, do the project, do the project. So folks, I take no side in this, um, but what I will say is I always share to you is the takeaways. And I feel like a lot of our students, and I love my students, but I was looking at a, a LinkedIn survey recently, and they said that Gen Z, in their survey, LinkedIn, however representative it is, 80% of the respondents said, I wanna work for an organization that aligns with my values. And I love that. But my plea to you is if we can start having more conversations with our students about what their values are, and then to research these organizations before they come on board and to see if they're comfortable doing so. And what's that line of demarcation, right? Around, well, I could flex on this, but I'm not gonna flex on that. And to have these conversations and figure out how do I walk my talk and, and what's something that I'm willing to to quit over, or just something I'm just gonna have a quick conversation with my supervisor about. I think we need to really love and respect the fact that they're very values forward in general, I'm sure there's exceptions, but in general, this generation is all about the values and that's amazing. But we're not having conversations around how do they navigate, explore, and walk the talk of those values. So that is the end of my time. I'm gonna stop the share um, right now. And um, I know people have things to do. I will stick around if you want to stick around. I will send you all the information you may want. Thank you so much. Be well. And I'll see you down the road. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. What a, a great conversation today. And especially as we think about how to help students align their values with their work and then how to engage in those meaningful conversations when there is an alignment and not to just let it all go and say, you know, I think our first response always it could be, I'm done. I don't want to deal with this. Right. But if we're really working in community with each other and we're doing that in our workplaces, we've got to be able to have those conversations. So I really appreciate all your examples today and, and how you're helping students do that. I think they're good examples for us to think about as we're navigating that with our own students. So thank you very, very much. Um, thank you all for joining us today. I hope you have a lovely weekend. Um, we will send out all this recording. So if you have colleagues that you'd like to share it with, um, we'll send that out probably mid next week. And we'll also link to the resources that Jim provided. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. Thank you all. And Happy as Jim said, I'm staying for a couple minutes if anyone has any questions, but I'm going to stop our recording. <laughs>